as a screen share. Can y'all see anything? Uh, yeah, it looks, looks good. Okay, cool. So this is code reuse in PureScript, functions, type classes, and interpreters. It's, uh, it's really kind of a presentation on kind of polymorphism in PureScript. But I, I tend to like to use code reuse as, like, as, that, as that term. But it kind of I, it make polymorphism a little less scary, just to know that like, writing polymorphic code isn't necessarily scary, but you can, you can approach it as, as a way to make code reusable. And so I kind of like going about that aspect of polymorphism and turning code that's not necessarily reusable into code that is reusable. So there's different types of polymorphism. Are you talking about like a universally quantified polymorphism? Uh, that's generally what we mean in, uh, in PureScript, yeah. I mean, and that's, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's writing code generic over the types like it, letting a caller like decide the types that they want to use. So, but we'll look at, we'll kind of like go through that. That's not like terribly important to get started. Um, but I, I think I've, I've always felt like functional programming makes writing code, code <laughs> excuse me, writing code fun, but I still want to only write my code once. And so I wanted to take a look at um, code that is not reusable and then kind of figure out what does it mean for code to be reusable and then turning code in that code into reusable code. So I wanted to just walk through just some really a toy example that is like on the surface, not reusable at all. And, uh, or at least minimally reusable. It's just a simple function called say hello. That's from list string to list string. And as an example of its usage, you would just give it some names and the result you'd get back, is just hello prepended to all of those names. And I would say this is an example of not very reusable code. Like it does one thing pretty easily, pretty well in that it prepends hello. And it's reusable in the sense that you can give it different lists of names, but other than that, there's not really any usable, reusable things about it. And as it like the implementation, if you were to just implement this straight as it is, um, without any other utilities, this is what you, this is what you might write. Uh, it's just a, a pretty basic recursive function that just pattern matches on its argument and prepends the name to it and builds a new list out of it. So we have these cases of like the nil case and then pattern matching on the list, the cons, and it rebuilds it and recurses on the tail. It, immediately, like if we wanted to find something that we could extract from this, like since it's not reusable, is like what can, we, what can we extract from this to make it slightly more reusable? And one, one thing to look at is what are, what are our assumptions that we're making in the code that we're writing? So an assumption that we're writing or that we're making in this function specifically, or one that stands out to me uh, right away is that we're assuming that someone wants to prepend the word hello to it. So if we wanted to make something slightly more reusable, we might pull out the hello into an argument to make as an argument to our function. And I feel like functions are kind of our first step towards making for, for making reusable code. So you always take an assumption, in this case, the string hello, and you make it an argument to your function. So in this case, it's prefix. Instead of using hello directly, we're going to take prefix as an argument. And this lets you write. Now, all, all of a sudden, we've already got more reusable code and that it's the same function, I can reuse this to all, say hello, but also say goodbye. And so I, I've, I have the same functionality that I had before, or I can produce the same functionality, but I can also produce functionality on top of that. And it's this kind of process that we go through to make, see how we can make something where we've, where we've made assumptions about what we want to do and pulling out those assumptions and letting the user specify their own assumptions instead of baking that into the function. And so another thing, another uh, assumption that we might make that I, I think this function is making is that we want to prepend something. We want to use this prepend operation. So we can pull that out. Instead of assuming we want to prepend it, we can pull out any sort of function that does this modification. So I've renamed this function transform. 
which lets us just modify whatever item that we're currently focused on. And it just takes us as an edit func parameter. So rather than taking a prefix, we take a function that can modify it in any way. In the same way, we can either do a prepend all and recover all of our prepend functions, but we can also write an append all function, which adds a suffix instead of a prefix. And this lets, already we're getting this kind of like multiplication of reuse from this function. Another assumption is that we want to work on strings. And this is something, this is an easy transformation because lots of times we tend to write monomorphic code. Uh, like our first pass is usually, okay, what, what is the problem at hand? And one of the things that we can easily do a lot of the times is just replace our, like in this example, replace a string and replace it with a type parameter. So it's the same, it's the same sort of process that we go through where instead of, Assuming we want to use a string, we pull that out as an argument. And since it's just in a type, we use a type level argument. So in this case, for a function, we would introduce a for all, which is just a, lets us introduce basically, it's not even basically, exactly introduce a type argument parameter. So I'm gonna call this val. And I don't actually have to change any of the function itself. Uh, all, I, all I've done is remove the string, put in val, and it's still type checked. So that just tells us that our function was already fairly reusable, but the type that we specified was over specific. And sometimes you, what you can do is even just leave off the, 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 the type signature and let the, the compiler tell you a, a, a generally polymorphic function signature. And so in this case, all we've done is change the type signature, but we've already got something that's more reusable. So in this case, we still have all, we recover all of our original functionality of prepend all and append all, but now we can do things on different types. So now we've got like a, a negate all function, which just flips. Um, uh, this should actually not be negate. I think this is actually a typo. It's supposed to be not all. So it would just flip all the booleans instead of um, instead of taking a string. And likewise, for for ints, you could do uh, at all which just add, instead of using like prepending a prefix or something, you could, you could add a number to it. So we, we've, we're getting more and more reusability out of this. Another assumption that we made was that we wanted this function to return the same type. And this is another, this is another case where we've just over-specified our type. So we've used this val to val, but there's no reason that this function has to go from val to val. There's nothing in our implementation that, that requires that. So we can actually pull out the second val into another type parameter. So now we get this A to B, this list A to list B. And again, I haven't, I haven't had to change any of my implementation. I'm just pulling out assumptions that we're making and making them arguments to our function and also arguments to our type. Again, we've now, we have even more functionality out of this same function now. It's more reusable because we can go from numbers to strings, et cetera. So the last thing we want to look at, I mean, this is pretty polymorphic, but you, we want to look at, like, is there, I see only one more assumption in this function signature. And, uh, and that's, the, that's that we're going to work on lists. But what happens if we try to pull out list as a type parameter into this FAB, a to B, F of A to F of B. I now have no, con nothing concrete to work off of. So I can't actually implement this function in and of itself. I can't say, I can't take an edit func and then implement this because I don't know what F is. The, the user has, has, would be specifying it. And so this means I can't make any more assumptions about the implementation. So this is kind of like our base case of generality. And since I can't implement this, I, but I, it, it is a good pattern. I feel like this could be a pattern. And so you might actually pull this out into a type itself. So this whole signature of transform FAB. So we've got an A to B to an F of A, or, and, get, and you take an F of A and return an F of B. And so, but I can, since I could implement it for lists, I can use this signature to, uh, to show like what this pattern is. So this pattern is a transform over lists from A to B. And all I've done here is just fill in these type arguments. I, I, since I just pulled out the signature 
and just to, because I feel like it's a usable pattern, a reusable pattern, and you can implement the same sort of transform then for arrays or trees or any other, or many other types. So they might be have their own concrete implementations, but they're kind of unified by this transform signature. They all have the same signature. And one thing about this is that all of these transforms are also polymorphic in their A's and B's. They don't, they aren't necessarily, but I, I know specifically for arrays, you can implement this for arrays, you can implement this for tr trees, which would allow it to be polymorphic over both A and B. So one thing we can do is then move that into our signature. So this type transform of F, now our for all is under our type signature, our pattern. So this just requires that anytime we want to use this pattern, it has to be polymorphic over A and B. It has to, it can't, it has to let the user specify A and B. They can't make an assumption about what A and B are. And so this just means we've kind of simplified our type signature now. So this transform list has a signature. So it's, it's again, it's the same implementation, but now we just have this, this pretty uh, straightforward signature of transform list. And we could then implement the same thing for transform array and transform tree. And again, this is, this is what it would look like if like our, all of our functions that we had previously specified, they would just, if we wanted to be polymorphic over some sort of transform, then we'd have to take the entire transform as an argument. So all of these are just implemented in terms of transform, but we have to take transform as the first argument. And then it immediately calls transform. So we've recovered a good, we have even more uh, reuse here through this, because now we don't have to necessarily work on lists. I can implement, for format all or negate all or add all for anything that has a transform or the user can user can provide some transformation function or transformer so before this is what our implementation looked like of say hello we got list string to list string and after we're just we have say hello implemented in terms of this transform this gone through this process of trying to pull out our assumptions we can still implement the say hello in terms of transform. And all this looks like now is that our original say hello, you just provided the list, and our new say hello, you're providing the transformation function. So this transform list, our, our particular implementation for that. But what we can also then do is provide like a transform array or a transform tree. And so this say hello implementation is now more reusable because we can do this sort of thing over any data type that can, we can provide a, trans, a transformer for. And I used to use the tra word transformer very loosely. I don't mean that in any sort of like in the pure script ecosystem. So don't, have an, don't make an assumption about the name. And I think, you know, this is like, this is, this is where a lot of languages stop as far as like making reusable code and, and functions are a really good use, are a really good tool for making reusable code. Uh, but there's some redundant, there's even some more redundancy or there's some redundancy here. And that's, if you provide a transformer, you also have to provide the same type. So you can't provide one transformer and then provide a different type. And so one of the questions we have, or one of the things we do in pure script is that that's a, that's a kind of a redundant assumption. And so the compiler, we have a feature called type classes that, let the com that lets the compiler, compiler provide these implementations for us. And those are called type classes. And so the transformation we're gonna make now is just before we had this type transform F where we just specify this pattern in terms of this type alias, we're gonna use class transform F. So it's the same, kind of the same signature but we're just using a different language feature. Whereas before we provided the type signature of our, of our pattern on the left-hand side of a type alias, now we're providing that same signature in the body of a type class. So you see they're, they're basic, they're almost exactly the same thing. They just have kind of a different syntactic form. And whereas before we wrote this transform list, this concrete implementation of transform list, in order to provide an implementation or have the compiler to, or, uh, to hook into this feature, we then specify an instance, instance and it's the same thing. So here, a transform list to trans is, is a, the type is transform list, and in pure script, 
It's just instance. It's wrapped in this instance keyword. Same, it has a name as well. Um, although the name, in, the, the name in this case is not, uh, it's, it's just aesthetic. It's just for uh, code generation. The compiler doesn't use the name. Uh, but the name isn't important. You can't refer to it. But um, we still provide it and, it, and it kind of, it provides a nice sort of like translation between the two. And so that you're just wrapping it in this instance keyword. And before we provided our implementation like this, and with an instance, you provide, you can provide the same implement, the same implementation. You're just using the name of the method that the class specified. And whereas before all of our reusable code explicitly took this transform F as a type argument, with type classes because the compiler can then wire everything together for us, we don't actually have to specify that. I mean, we specify it in the signature and you can see that the only thing that's really changed in the type signature is that the, the thin arrow changes to a fat arrow. But other than that, we don't have to specify the explicit argument. But we still recover all the same functionality. Then also here before, this was our original say hello, and uh, after, with type classes, this is our new say hello. And I don't have to see, I'm not taking an extra argument. Again, before, this is our usage. And then after, our usage is, just, is exactly the same as it was before. It's just more reusable. And we can now call it with other implementation or other, against other types. And the compiler can fill in the implementation for us. So I think this is like a, a good way to show like what you get from it. Like before, like our monomorphic usage of say hello and then our polymorphic usage after the fact are both exactly the same. So the user is not paying a cost in the sense of like of having to manually wire something together or change the convenience of calling the function. The convenience is the same. You just get more reuse out of it because you can call it on different types. And so this class is obviously something we know and love in PureScript, and that's called functor. It's the same. I've just, I just use this name, this transform F, it's just for illustration. But we call this functor, and, and the implementation is called map, or the, uh, the, the signature, the, the dictionary, has this map function instead of transform. So, but the, our, our like how we reuse things doesn't really stop here because the question you can ask is, can we reuse type classes? Like we've gone through this process with functions and making a function more reusable by taking parameters and then, but can we do the same thing with type classes? So we've encapsulated this one transform kind of pattern into functor and uh, can we then make this fun, can we reuse this functor? In other cases, so we in PureScript we build on this with other classes. One such class is apply, and its signature is very similar to functor. It's just the first argument has this f around it, and it turns out that anything that can implement apply can also implement functor. And so we like to state like, is this is this reusable? If we were to use this, this is just some example garbage function. We don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter. Um, but if we wanted to use both map and apply without any sort of reuse among type classes, you'd have to ask for both of the things that you wanted. Even though we know that if you implement apply, there's also going to exist a valid map implementation, we still have to ask for these things, these two separate things explicitly. So we might look at how can we make this reusable? One possibility is to go ahead and add a map function to the apply class. And so we just call this a map because it, we don't want it to conflict with the functor map. But otherwise, they're supposed to be exactly the same. We want to try to say that this functionality exists. If you implement apply, then you also have to implement map because there's going to be a valid implementation. Um, and if we were to use this, like if someone were writing a library or something like that, they would have been, we would expect them to just fill in the map implementation but there's nothing that enforces this. And so you can actually get into, you can get into problems with this where someone might, you might specify a different, accidentally specify a different implementation. There's nothing to help you here. So the way we reuse type classes or reuse this information in PureScript is that we use what are called superclasses. 
And this just lets us specify dependencies among type classes. So in this case, we can say that, or not necessarily dependencies, but we call them entailments, so or like implications, so that if you have a apply f, it entails that a valid functor instance exists. And the compiler can then wrap this up for you so that if you ask for an apply, you don't have to explicitly ask for a functor. You get this sort of reuse among it, um, uh, among type classes. So given an, an apply, I can always get the functor functionality as well. I got a quick question for that. Yes. Um, I'm just curious about the motivation between, uh, for this level function. Before you had to specify that f had an instance of the functor and also apply, yeah. right? So is this um, meaning that the flubble function itself uh, wanted to use the map function? So the original signature, if the flubble function asks for both apply f and functor f, but this is redundant information because any apply f entails a functor f. Okay, so th th this is presuming that the apply and functor have some special relationship, right? Yeah. Like apply is, uh, specified, is implemented in terms of functor. Well, it'd be the it'd be the other way around. Like as far as like the actual type class, type class hierarchy, functor can be implemented in terms of apply. Mm -hmm. um, but the, it just turns out that the, there's a relationship between these two classes that build on each other. So apply can build on top of the information that functor gives you to kind of add more to it or mm -hmm. something more kind of more general. Uh, and, uh, we just want, we don't want to, if, if we want to use both map and apply, we don't want to make, ask for redundant things. We don't want to have to say both functor and apply because we know that if apply, if you have an apply, then a valid functor also exists. And so if I wanted to use both of them without any sort of like reuse among type classes, you have to ask for both of them. But the way we reuse type classes in PureScript through super classes means that if there's a superclass relation, I don't have to ask for both of them if I want to use both of them. I can just ask for apply, and the compiler knows that functor exists through this superclass relationship, and it'll automatically wire it up for me. I don't, I don't have to explicitly ask for both. Okay. Does, that make, does that answer your question? Yeah, so um, if the superclass is, uh, th th this declaration wasn't able to be specified to the compiler, then, we'd then each use site, of apply would need to specify that a functor. Yeah, you'd ha it would have to, it would just be applying, or you would have, you as the author just have to specify both dependencies, yeah. even though it's redundant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're, and I want to take a look at kind of what this means, like as far as like, oh, why this is useful, why this is helpful, because it's not this it kind of on the surface, it seems like that's, that's kind of cute but it's also helpful to look at like what the compiler is doing for you with this, like, like with this feature, what it's actually doing for you. And so I want to look at what these, what this does or what this would be like without compiler assisted type classes. So if we were just using explicit parameter passing, how might we, we how might we package up these sort of, this sort of reuse among implementations or relationships? between these, uh, these uh, kind of patterns. So this uses, this is kind of like, this is our, it's not kind of, this is exactly our pattern that we used in the first part of the talk. We've just, I, instead of taking the one signature, it's just a record. Instead, that has a member map and apply has a member apply. And so if we wanted to specify the kind of relationship where apply always has a map implementation, or in this case, uh, what our flubble would look like. All, all it is, it's the same, the signature's kind of the same, we're just taking explicit dictionaries and you have the apply dict and the functor dict. So you would just take these two records as separate arguments, explicitly. But if we wanted to do the same sort of reuse where apply uh, entails a functor, there's always a valid implementation for it, then what, all that means is that we would have to also put our, a functor implementation inside of our, or a functor dictionary inside of our apply dictionary. And so this means I can only take one, dic I only have to take one dictionary. So in this case, apply F, this apply dict. And if I want to use both map and apply, then I just have to, I have to like dig in to this, this nested functor dictionary.
So I can refer to apply, but then if I want to get at map, then I have to dig into functor and then pull out the map as well. And then as, as we build, accumulate more, more things on top of this, so applicative is the next type class in the hierarchy, which just adds pure, and applicative always entails an apply instance, so then we just wrap up that apply dictionary in it as well. So I, can only, I only have to ask for applicative, but then I get pure, I have to dig into apply to get apply, then dig into apply, functor, map, so we just, we're just digging down the hierarchy to get at the different implementations that we want, or the methods that we want. But this gets kind of hairy, uh, anytime you have like a non-trivial class and the no a non-trivial class that I always like to bring up that kind of showcases the magic of type classes is traversable because traversable is not like a kind of a pie in the sky or like an ivory tower sort of thing like traversable any sort of real world application is going to use traversable because traverse is just mapping basically mapping with effects. And so that's something that's super common. You know, if you have like a list of IDs or something, you want to be able to go over all the, those IDs and maybe make a request for each one and pull in resources. So you make a request for each item in it and get the item back out of it. And so mapping with effects is something that's super, super common. And um, one thing that's really neat about traversable is, I mean, one, it, it look, it's kind of intimidating on the surface because there's a lot of type parameters. It entails both functor and foldable, and then each member also is polymorphic over some applicative. And so this, this kind of gives us this multiplication effect of code reuse, which is really neat. And something that's, kinda, that's really unique is uh, that like given any sort of traversable structure, structure that's anything that implements traversable, and then anything that implements applicative, which is kind of our effects, you can combine any two of them. So if I wanted a list with af, you can combine those two. If I wanted an array with f or effect, then you can combine those two or any and anything, any uh, kind of like derivation thereof. And so you, ought, you ought get this sort of explosion of code reuse for free. And that's something that's kind of like really neat about like this, this sort of polymorphism, but it doesn't really work very well without type classes or compiler-assisted type classes. So if we're gonna bundle up this sort of functionality in an explicit dictionary, so you have traverse, sequence, those same signatures, but they're taking explicit applicatives. And then we also have this functor and foldable uh, entailments. So we're gonna take these two, these two dicks, traversable T, applicative T. Or uh, let's say I, I, I want to I wanna write Flubble and it's both, it uses T, it uses both the traversable and the applicative instance of T. So we're looking at all the ways, and I might want to use map. They both entail a functor. So traversable entails functor, applicative entails functor. And these are all kind of the possibilities of where we can drill down. And you can get map from both traversable and you can get map from both functor. And so you get this sort of diamond problem where you can arrive at different implementations. If you're not enforcing it in any way, if the compiler isn't helping you in any way to wire these together, then depending on which one you use, you might get a different, if, if it wasn't necessarily wired together correctly or something like that, you know, if, since you're building these dictionaries yourself, it's, it's easy to get wrong. And what the compiler does is it just enforces that any way you go at it, you'll always get the same implementation for map in this case. And so, uh, that's something that's really important about having compiler assisted type classes is that we know we'll always get a good solution out of it. It finds the solution for us. If you wanted to use math, it, it enforces one that no matter which way you go, you'll always get the same one. And then it also, it also makes that decision for you. So you don't even have to think, so you don't have to think about it. The other, if, if I can make a comment, uh, the other thing that's important about that, I, I've done some sort of simulating of type classes with records in Elm where we don't have type classes. Right. And one of the things that happens, like even in a simple case, like let's say a map where you need to supply an ORD um, type class, um, there, there's no, when you're supplying your, your own dictionaries, there's nothing that actually guarantees that you're supplying the same dictionary each right. time you're calling a function on a on a structure right and right. Uh, and so which is on the one hand really flexible and occasionally is kind of fun 
but it, it also it doesn't really allow you to enforce certain kinds of invariants. And, uh, and so you can really get yourself into trouble that way. And so the, the fact that the, the type classes um, uniquely associate uh, a, um, an instance with a type actually ends up being a kind of a feature when you're uh, writing a library like that. Right. And, uh, and the fact that you have to use a new type if you want a different instance uh, which we sometimes sort of see as a, a kind of a uh, inconvenience is actually quite essential. Yeah, and, and that's, part, that's part of what is how you know, the compiler enforces that you're always getting the same. Like, so in this case, when you have a diamond problem, uh, if you want to use map, but you can get map from multiple places, um, the compiler requires, since it in order to know that you'll always get the same one, no matter which way you take, which one you dereference, um, it has to require only one single unique implementation of it. Yeah. So that's, yeah, so that, uh, that, that's kind of like how it gets at that. And that's, yeah, and that's something that's, that's super, that's really useful. And um, while it seems, definitely le it seems definitely less flexible on the surface, what this means is that no matter where you, like copy and paste code, like you, in, in, under any sort of refactoring, you know you're always going to get the same thing. And that, I think this is actually something that's really useful for code reuse, is because um, it, when you're trying to make code me, more reusable, you do lots of refactoring or, and you like move things between modules. And the problem of uh, making sure that you're always wiring up the same thing uh, goes away. The compiler just always kind of has your back on that case. And um, you know, I, I think that's definitely actually a feature in practice. And there are, there are cases where uh, this gets even more complicated. And I mean, this is kind of like, this is just using like one of the, one of the first like real world sort of patterns of traversable, I think is like one of the big real world patterns. Um, and you, you already get into this. And so there's other types, other things that like a big one is compose where you have two functor or up through applicative. You can compose any two of them and you get an applicative instance out of it that works over both of them. And so the way those sort of compose is just automatically done through, through the compiler. And if you didn't have the compiler automatically doing that, then it gets very, very hairy, very, very quickly. And so you just end up not using any of those things that's, which are super useful. I actually use compose in our code base awake you know sometimes it's just it's really easy to throw a composed new type around it and you uh you get lots of like cool stuff out of it for free so i wanted to, i want to kind of take this process then of like extracting out functions like into parameters and and apply it to sort of some toy real code instead of just like a list or something like that um maybe something that looks a little bit more real world. And I feel like real code, you're gonna do effects in either effect or af. And so this is just a toy example. Um, it's, it's just kind of dumb. I, I just assume very simple things. Like, I, like the implementations don't really matter of, these, of like the specifics, but what this just says, this real code is going to make, attempt to read a file cache. And then we assume that this read file returns a nothing or a just. And so in the case of nothing, then there's no, there's no error handling here. It's, since it's an app, it's probably throwing exceptions. But uh, in the case of nothing, that means that there's no cache. And in that case, we'll want to make an HTTP request to purescript.org and get the content out of it and then write it back to the cache and then return the content. And then if the content's already there, we just return it. And if it's already there in the cache, we just return it. So this is, a, this is some real code that makes a cached request. And it's, it's not very good, it's not very good code because, I mean, there's all sorts of problems with this. It indefinitely caches something, it's in a fixed location. So there's lots of assumptions baked into this. And so it's kind of, it's good to look at something like this how, and how we can make it reusable. And the first step here, or like one assumption is just that we wanna we want to look at purescript.org. Maybe we don't want to call purescript.org every time. And so we'll go through the same process of pulling out an argument. So instead of, instead of using that assumption, baking in that assumption, we're going to have a parameter for URL. Another assumption on top of this might be cache. 
So instead of putting it, you know, putting it always in the same file is kind of problematic, especially if you're making multiple requests to different URLs, you get the wrong content. So maybe path and URL are two different. We will plot the path as well. And so that'll allow the user to specify a, a different path location for every URL. And so now we're already getting more reusable here, this get URL with cache. And so this is like kind of a pretty big leap here, but instead of our assumption here is that we're actually wanting to call fs.read file or http.get or write file. These are concrete implementations. And this is, this is really hard to test. One, because this is actually going to write files and is actually going to like make HTTP requests. And so if we wanted to test just the logic, this would be, we'd have to rely on like out of band observations of the file system. And it's also, it ends up being kind of non-deterministic because like what if the HTTP request fails, you know, maybe your network went down while you were testing it. And so we want to pull out the assumption of these impl specific implementations and make them arguments. So instead of calling a specific fs.read file, I'm going to take that as an argument. And the same with get and write file. And so I'm just going to take those as arguments and substitute them in the same place. And we can actually like, we're, this is now immediately more, much easier to test because if I wanted to you know, provide a dummy, like a dummy implementation, I could do that. And, you know, that doesn't make an HTTP request, but maybe just returns a constant, uh, you know, content or something like that. And it's actually with records, it's pretty nice. And that we, maybe we just take like our effect, an effects record and I can bundle up all those with labels and I can just kind of like pass this around. So this is actually pretty useful. And, but we're still making an assumption here. And one of the assumptions is, is that we're actually wanting to write code in AF. So one, if we wanted to test this, we could provide dummy implementations, but we'd still have to uh, just run it. We still have to run everything in AF. Like this is this logic is pretty easy to test, and it's pretty easy to test purely. And so maybe instead of making baking in the assumption of AF, we're going to pull that out and do a type parameter. M. So we'll just call this M. We call it M. Excuse me. We call this M just because if I'm going to write like anything with do syntax or sequence any effects like this, I'm going to need a monad constraint. And so we, we've also added that. Uh, another assumption is the request type. You know, this request here, the, the assumption we're making with the request is that we want to, we want to request a string, you know, which would be like a URL. And uh, so there's something a little more general here. Like maybe it's not since, you know, we're, we're generic over M. I'm just kind of renaming these now instead of like FS read file, maybe it's just cache read cache, write, And then kind of a general request where I can take any kind of request because if the user provides it, they're already providing the string in the other case. So in this case, they're providing the path. There's no reason to make bake that assumption in. And so this lets us do kind of a more general pattern of request with string. And, I, and I've just renamed things to make it a little more, it's actually more clear about kind of like what the logic is doing. So we're gonna say cache read, cache write, and just request. So this makes cached requests. I have a question. Yes. Since um, you know, you're going through this process of refactoring and this is supposed to be real code, I'm just curious, if, is that what happens in, in real life? You start out with a very basic um, solution and then go back and refactor, refactor, refactor until you finally get yeah, it. Very I, I, perfect. You know, I think, I mean, I've, we've definitely done this in the past, you know. So I, I used to work at Slam Data and just like one of the things, like the original version of the app, we baked in the assumption that we wanted to use app everywhere. And so this has a lot of problems, makes things kind of hard. Uh, because anytime, anytime you want to like, you know, anytime you don't want to bake in an assumption, you have to like take it as an argument. So we're, so in one of the, er, in the earlier versions of slam, in the slam data code base, we were trying to pass around all these dictionaries everywhere. This, the same kind of thing. And we, and we went through the same process of like pulling that out, making type parameters and stuff like that. And, and just, I think as you get more experience, you kind of automatically do that. And you kind of, you, 
you kind of start seeing those opportunities and uh, and it's not always the case you know sometimes you don't need anything that's really polymorphic and reusable but i think for real code especially you want something reusable because you want to be able to test it i mean you you already you have two different contexts in which you want to run the logic but those logic those different contexts have different you want to make different assumptions and so in different contexts instead of running aff you might, maybe you want to just supply everything in, in a pure way and so I, I think that's like a good case for reuse. You're only reusing it twice, but if you bake in some these sorts of assumptions of implementations, then you can't, you already get something that you can't test and you just kind of hope that it works. And so I think as the more and more you do this, you kind of start to see where you can go ahead and pull out your assumptions. Sometimes you, it's fine, you know, writing a concrete implementation, like you don't ever need anything reusable. And so sometimes in, maybe in the future though, you'll come back to it and you'll be like, you'll like, I can, I can see how I, I might want to reuse this. I did the same thing over here and you'll go back and kind of pull out your assumptions in, this, in, in kind of this manner. Yeah. And I think that's one of the real advantages of functional programming. It seems like uh, for the most part, you can go back and refactor and you're not caught in a trap. Right, right, where it's just impossible to refactor uh, to make it polymorphic. Uh, it's it's on a rare occasion that I can't go back and refactor something to be polymorphic. And one thing that's actually what's that's really interesting, especially for languages like PureScript and Haskell, is that when you're going through this process of making something more reusable or taking a parameter, you don't have a restriction on what sorts of things you can take as a parameter. So if you, in this particular example, I'm I don't want to assume af. Well, I can just replace literally the keyword af with a type parameter. There's no restriction on the shape of what that might be. So in languages, that this is higher kind of types. And in languages that don't have this, you have a restriction on the sort of shapes of types that you can pull out and you can, that you can extract, ex abstract over. If you don't have this feature, then you can only abstract over things like string or unit in this case. You couldn't abstract over something like af. And uh, I, that's, that's something that's really important for this sort of transformation is not having that sort of restriction. It, you get so many more opportunities for reuse if you can do this. And so we're gonna, we're gonna so in our original example, like in the previous part of the talk, we pulled it out into type classes. And so we're gonna do sort of the same thing. We're gonna just kind of skip ahead if you, places I'm not going to pull out like specific types and stuff like that but I'm gonna go ahead and just make them classes and uh, so in this case monad cat I'm gonna call this monad cache and it's gonna have the read and write functions with it and the same thing with request it's gonna have the request function and this uses some like functional dependencies which is just a feature of type classes that help with inference it helps the compiler kind of decide decide which implementation to pick and makes it easier or, or it makes it a little less flexible, but makes it much more nicer to use. And so you don't have to specify as many things. And, um, and I've also used the reuse because both of them are going to require Monad anyway, if I want to do anything with it really. And so I'm going to pull that out into an, into a super class. So I don't have to request that as well. I don't have to request the redundant information of requiring a Monad dictionary or requiring a Monad implementation. And so it's the same as this, the exact same kind of capability. It's just now I'm taking it with type classes and I don't have to provide those implementations up front as arguments. And so this is what our implementation looks like now with this request with cache. I have pulled out the reusable components of it and now I can write my real code just in terms of the location and the address that we want to request. And what this gives us is that I can instantiate one implementation of it, say with our at monad type, which would have to satisfy this monad cache and monad request. But I, then I can also just instantiate it with a different one. Our test monad might provide a pure implementation for it. Test monad might be completely pure, might be just like a new type over, I don't know, it might be a new type over a state or something like that, some other pure, pure monad. And so I've already got something, this real code is more reusable because just by saying, specifying a different type, I can, it instantiates it with different implementations. And this is like the compiler fills in everything for me in that case. And so we have like this library 
in transformers of just these different sorts of effects that we can compose together that are, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but um, are pretty reusable. So reader is for like an environment state is for state operations. Writer is for logging. Monad error is for uh, like throwing exceptions or catching exceptions. And so that we've just reused this pattern. Like these are just uh, kind of like distilled kind of bare bones, reusable components, but for like actual applications, you might implement some things like this, like a cache or a request. So I wanted to look at like a quiz here then of which code is more reusable. And so just looking at like a type signature. So this is a, like a, a utility function index of, so it takes a string, takes two strings and returns a maybe int. And so what this does is, this is something that's in data.string. This you know, finds a needle in a haystack and returns the index if it was found. But there's an alternative signature of it. So maybe we wanted to go through that same process of pulling out in, we, our assumptions. Instead of assuming that we want a maybe, maybe we take the cases as arguments. So I'm not going to assume that we want to return a maybe, but I can take a function that does something with our index, or I can take a default case. And by our rules, this the second one, I think, probably looks like it's more reusable because we've, we're now taking, we don't have the same assumptions. We're taking them as arguments. We're using, we have like a type parameter R. All, you know, all the kind of ingredients look like it's more reusable. But in practice, both of these are equivalent. And, and why is that? Why is, it, why is the second one not necessarily more reusable than the first one? And part of that is because we can, if you look at this first example here of using it, we, we can observe what maybe is. We can pattern match on it. We can, it's maybe is not an opaque type. It's, it's transparent. The representation is transparent and we can observe it. And so that would allow us to implement both of these signatures in terms of the other one, which means that they're both equally expressive. One might have different performance characteristics or something like that but they're both equally expressive. I could, I could just compose, like the maybe version, I could compose another or wrap it in a different function that takes arguments and pattern matches on maybe. Or in the other case, I could supply nothing and just as my implementation and recover the exact same functionality. And this sort of dual... I have a question about that. I think that's really interesting um, that, you, that these are <laughs> equally reusable because my my initial impression is always if there's a, if there's a universally quantified type there like a for all r then that obviously must be more reusable. Right. Uh, it's interesting that you point out that it, you can implement one in terms of the other, and it's equivalent. And you, you use the idea of like the this transpa transparent type maybe it's transparent type. So if maybe with a type that didn't have its constructor, it's exported. If it only had accessors by a, a you know, de de deconstructor functions. Um, as long as there are some deconstructor functions, then it's you'd kind of still call it a transparent type, yeah. Right. It's, it's as long as there's some way to observe the representation, then you can, you know, they would be the same. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe it has a transparent representation. We can pattern match on it directly, but mm -hmm. but you know, it's we'd call it an eliminator. Is if you just provided functions for observing it to kind of prod at it, then. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's equivalent. So it's, it's equivalent to casing on it, like pattern matching on it. Pattern matching like with a case statement is, like a, is a language convenience, but it's not fundamental. So this, is, this maybe type is different than like uh, AF. Um, right, and, and, I'm about to, and I'm, 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 I'm about to get to that. Oh, great. <laughs> I see why you're pushing along here. I'll let you. Yeah, so we get we get this kind of dual these two these two duels of something that you can observe like we can observe what a maybe is we don't have to like pass in an implementation because we can observe what a maybe is and then the dual of it is where we do pass in the implementation but then the the function that we're calling can't observe our r it has to be, it's polymorphic over it so this this kind of this dual encoding one of them is called final encoding and that's where we provide an implementation as an argument so in this case, the second index of would be our final encoding and versus an initial encoding where we interpret a result. 
So as long as we have, we get a result back that we can observe, that we can break down case, that's representation is transparent, then, then we can do the same thing with it. And that's just, that's called an initial encoding. That's really, that's really the only difference between the two is where, whether you're going to provide the implementation that you want to do with it up front and the function you're calling calls your implementation. So like kind of like a callback or whether the implementation bakes in all the assumptions that it's making. But if you can observe all those functions, all those assumptions after the fact, then you can transform it. And so that has uh, similar levels of expressivity. So if you wanted to look at something that is not, that we, I would say does not have a transparent representation, it would be something like our real code. So our, our assumption is that, is that we're using app. But the problem is, is that app doesn't export anyway. You can't observe any intermediate steps of app. All you can do is run it and get the result out of it, the string out of it. But say we wanted this logic that we have in app, say we wanted to represent it in a way that is transparent and in a way that we can observe it. And so what we do is go through, the, go through a process of trying to represent our assumptions as a data type. And so this is like a first pass of, the, of, the, of our assumptions here. So our, our, our things that are AF are like read file, HTTP get, write file. And so I'm gonna pull those out into a data type. So read file takes a string, write file takes a path and a string like the content, HTTP get takes a request path. This isn't really, try to do anything with this. It's, you can't really do anything with it because this doesn't fully represent what we're doing because there's no return type here. This data type doesn't have specify that it returns a string. It doesn't specify that you can get something out of it. This is just like the argument. So one attempt at like trying to use this might be to, you know, back package it up into like a list of operations or something or an array of operations that you could then kind of pull apart. But since you can't specify any sort of dependencies among them, you can't, there's no, there's no way, no way to thread that information around. And so kind of the way we specify return types in a data type would be then to take a function to put, to put an implementation into the data type that uses it. So, so read file returns a maybe string. Well, we'll take, we'll pull out a result, this, this a parameter, because we want to be able to have like dependencies, we want to have like logic around it. We want to be able to return either a string or an int. Like if you look at our original example, this aff string, we want to kind of preserve that. Like there's no reason when writing something in aff that you have to return a string or return unit, you can return different types. And so we're going to pull out that type parameter A, specify that we can return anything we want. And we create these dependencies with functions in our constructors. And so read file takes a string and it yields a maybe string. And so we're going to put in a, a function that consumes a maybe string. Same with write file. It's imperative. And so it doesn't yield anything aside from unit. But you know, we'll, that function can, it kind of thunks it. And you can kind of, re you can reduce this so that it only takes an A. But I feel like good for, for illustration purposes, it's going to yield a unit value. And uh, same with HTTP get, it'll yield a string, given a string parameter. And we have to introduce done. Because we want to say we want, we want this computa computation to eventually end, and if we don't specify that, then it just kind of has to go on kind of forever. Um, maybe we don't want to do anything; we just want to like immediately stop. And so it's we're always going to have probably have we're going to have a done constructor here, and just using this using this construction, this data type construction, I can represent this the same logic that I had before. It's just, it's just represented as a data type now. So like read file, I'm gonna put the parameter in and I'm gonna put in a function that consumes the cached value. This looks very similar to like our do notation, right? Except the arrow is just going to the opposite direction. Do kind of lets us invert that arrow. So it looks more in, like imperative code we're used to. But there's no reason, but this function is just, it's gonna consume a cached value then. After that, it's going to case on it. Then we're going to put in the HTTP get. It's going to consume content, write file, etc. And it's going to end with a done, a done value. So this lets us sequence any sort of like any combination of read file or write file or HTTP get in any order, and eventually yield a value in done.
Does that kind of make sense, this transformation? I want to make sure I'm still here, <laughs> not, not disconnected. So mm -hmm. if we then wanted to actually turn this into AF to run it to do real things, we would have a function that converts our real code string data type into AF. And what this would end up looking like, we're going to case on our real code, real code to AF. We're going to look at read file. We're going to pull out the path. And we get this next call back out of it, too, because we've put this function in it for the next, to get the next step out of it. Maybe we'll, ru we'll run an actual read file. This is our concrete implementation of read file. And we're going to get the content out of it. And then we're going to pass the content to our callback, our next callback. And then we're going to just recurse over that and interpret the next step. This real code, so you, the real code to app, it's just, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get the next step out of it by applying content to next. And so we're just going to do the same thing for all of our other uh, constructors in our data type. So write file will call write file and provide unit. HTTP get will, would call some HTTP implementation and provide the content, etc. But we can also, this is this signature then is already, um, we're, we're assuming that we want to yield a string value, but that's not necessary. In, in the same way before, like this, this type signature was, is too restrictive. And so we could actually pull this out, this for all A out, and the same function would continue to work. And uh, just now our interpreter here can then yield any sort of value out of it, depending on what, our, what we've built. And this is just what the squiggly, the squiggly arrow is just a type <laughs> alias for this pattern. So the squiggly arrow lets us omit the A, the for all A. And this is really, this is the interpreter pattern. So writing an interpreter is casing on, is really casing on this data type without concern necessarily for what it's producing, and, but only on the spine of our data type. So real code to AF. It's only, it's translating something. It's doing a natural transformation from real code to AF without concern for what we've, what our logic, what our, what we're trying to yield. All it cares about is that we want to, we want to run this implementation in AF, run an implementation in AF. And so maybe we could, we could provide a different interpreter that goes from real code to identity. And this would just be like our pure test. And so the same thing, but we're just supplying constant values. You know, this is like, this is kind of like stubbing out a, a kind of like a mock fixture or something. So we're going to supply our, our test data. And so given this, this original implementation, I can call it with real code to app. And uh, I can also call it with real code to identity with the same real code. I, the same logic is bundled up in both of them, but I can run one in AF and run in, one in identity. And this is kind of similar to our type class thing that we were doing before where we were instantiating it with a different type and the compiler filled in that implementation. But in this case, where we've defined a transparent, kind of a data type with a transparent representation that we can pick apart and interpret. And so that gives us, the same sort of uh, reuse out of it, the same, I've only written real code once and I can apply different interpreters to it. So this is kind of like the, the essence of writing an interpreter is that there, there are a few positive aspects of it. And one, I only have to write things in this concrete real code. So instead of kind of looking, if you go back to this, the simple function index of, I would say index of looks easier to use. Like, uh, and I, I feel like a lot of people would say that like what, whereas the second one looks more polymorphic. The first one looks easier to use because it's only concrete types everywhere. And that, that's, that can be easier type to digest. Sometimes when you pull things out in arguments, it's hard to keep track of that in your brain. And one thing that's nice about interpreters is that, I get to write my logic in something that's just in a concrete real code. Like I don't, I don't have to pull out our, like type parameters and add type classes and stuff like that. I can just specify like real code, write it in terms of real code. And then anyone after the fact can do whatever they want with it. It's not, that's not really my concern anymore. I, I, I don't care about the implementation for my purposes. I've described everything that I want in terms of this concrete real code data type. And it's the job of the interpreter then to then take that, take that specification and do something with it. Um, 
and this this can be nice. This has some nice properties. Um, some not so nice properties are that the compiler doesn't help us in it. I mean, it helps us with the types and why, and but it doesn't help us wire anything together. So we're doing our explicit casing. We have to explicitly, you know, pass real code into some implementation or into some interpreter, and uh, and also this this doesn't have the same sort of compositional properties uh, immediately. So one thing with type classes, the compiler wires everything together. It takes care of the code reuse in like entailment in, or in, in entailment super classes. And it, it, it kind of like threads all these things together. So I don't have to like have any concern of where that comes from. And I can compose these different type classes together really easily. I just, I just request, I just put it in, a, in the type signature and the compiler fills in everything for me. But the compiler doesn't help us really with that in writing interpreters. I have this concrete real code, but this real code data type isn't extensible in any way. So if I wanted to do anything else, say I just had some, maybe some separate state to write or to use, or maybe I had, uh, instead of making HTTP requests, I also, you know, maybe I wanted to, uh, I, you know, what are the effects, you know, that we do instead of maybe writing HTTP requests, I have, maybe I have like an a API specification. And so, but it's not extensible. I'd have to go back and add new constructors to this data type. It's not re this data type is itself isn't really reusable. The code I write, like the specifications I write with it are reusable, but this data type isn't reusable. I can't mix this with other, other sort of operations because in the compilers doesn't really help me with that. And also the syntax is kind of doesn't look good. You know, I wouldn't really want to write programs like this. And so if you wanted to get like the nice do syntax back, you'd have to write like the monad instances and stuff like that. And you have to do that for every data type. Composing them together, you'd have to make a new date data type that sort of has both functionalities in it. You know, maybe that's just like nesting constructors and stuff like that. And you get into, you can get into the sort of the same depend the same diamond problem. And that maybe different things would use HTTP GET, but you just start nesting things, nesting data types. It, it you you get to the same sort of problems that you had before with explicit types, type classes, or like explicit dictionary passing, and that you may not get the same thing out of it. And so, but the, the nice thing is, is that I, I don't I, I don't really go into this, but you know, there, I did the free talk as well, and that kind of goes into it a little bit. But there are other like libraries that kind of help us with this. So the compiler doesn't necessarily have to help us, but we have libraries in like in PureScript free, which lets us kind of helps us with the syntax aspect of it. You know, we, we can, we're using like the monad laws out of it. And so we don't have to like write, derive, we don't have to write all these monad instances for each data type. We can just wrap it in free and get that, get that out of it. And then also in something like PureScript variant and PureScript run, which tackles sort of the compositional, the, the problems that you have with interpreters and lets you write uh, compositional data types and interpreters from them. And so you can kind of recover a lot of the same, the same solutions, but just in, in, with different tools. So there, that's my presentation. Any questions? That was terrific. Um, yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's really nice seeing that laid out in a kind of step-by-step -step way. It makes it very clear. Yeah. And I, I've got to look up your free talk sometime because uh, I need to see that one too. Yeah, I, I kind of think of, like I did that one first and I think this one's kind of like a prequel to it. Like it'd be good to like, you can like watch this. I think this, this talk is easy to, to digest as far as like why you might want to even like go there. And, um, and then like the free talk kind of breaks down what that actually does. Like if you wanted, oh, this interpreter aspect. And so like breaks down kind of what the free data type is and how you derive it in a similar way. And you can actually derive it from like, how we like pulled out these parameters for like our monad classes, like our different classes and stuff like that. If you do the same thing to data types, in order to, for like making interpreters and stuff like that, you just like kind of naturally arrive at that sort of that sort of uh, a solution of using something like free because it lets us pull out the done aspect, it lets us pull out the recursive aspect and stuff like that. And so 
um, which is, which is kind of nice. And so and the free talk kind of goes into that. And, uh, so I, I think that's like a nice follow up. Um, I have a question like towards the end there in the last few minutes, you were talking about, um, one of the problems with using this uh, data type, um, encoding of these operations for the free, for real code. Um, and then, then you said you can't compose it, right, with some other things. So the PureScript run library, which uses the variants and such, um, if we define the, this real code thing in terms of the concepts in that library, uh, then we can kind of uh, write different, write, write interpreter for you know one, two, three of these different types of real codes, and they, where each has a different uh, algorithm, right? It does some different real code mm -hmm. workflow, um, and and then if we have these three, we can compose them into right. one big yeah that's a thing is yeah that, that's exactly that right? right. So the problem in this real code is that what if I want to combine it with other effects? This real code only encapsulate like it encapsulates an HTTP get and like the cache read and write, and, and what if I want other effects? I want to re I want to use this is not reusable because I can't reuse real code like I've written real code. And it's reusable and then I can provide different interpreters for it, but real code itself is not reusable. So if I want to like to reuse that in a different context, I couldn't, I would have to provide an interpreter that then interprets real code into some other superset data type, you know, that, and one of that, that interpreter might just be wrap, putting a wrapper around it. You know, it, it might be something as, as trivial as that. Um, but like you, you, it would be nesting it. And so the, the readme of pure script run kind of goes, kind of talks about this problem of like, if I have these different data types that are closed, it, composing in, them together so that I can like take the composite meaning of them uh, doesn't, doesn't really work. Or it's just, it's hard. It's really hard. It's the same problem of trying to manually stitch together type classes. It's just, it gets, you get sort of into the same sort of problem where uh, you, uh, you, you're having to do a lot, like a lot of wiring yourself, not only wiring yourself, but you get into cases where you kind of like duplicate things. And then you have to like pick apart, like do I apply the same interpreter to it? I, like I, the same data type might be nested in different trees of, of effects, but is it necessarily the same interpreter or stuff like that? And so PureScript run and PureScript variant lets us then write extensible data types that you can kind of like mash together. So as long as you, this, I only care about like these cases of effects, but then over here, I only care about these cases of effects. Well, I can automatically combine them together and I get the superset of both effects and it all just gets flattened out. I don't have to like m handle this tree of data types and stuff like that. And so it yeah. just kind of, it composes. I have a quick question about that run one. Um, if, if you have this set of effects and this set of effects and they share the, like this one has a name, an effect named read file. And this other one also has an effect named like read file. Um, these can be smashed together, right? right. Because they're in different modules right. and the, like the name of this thing. Kind yeah. Of as long as the signature is the same, you might get into the case where one uses a read file, but it has a different signature than, than the other read file. In which case, like if that, you have to like solve that discrepancy somehow because they're too, Kind of like having two different type classes. You really want the names to be unique. What that's just kind of like the trade-off is, is that you want the names to be unique for each effect. And so if they're not unique, mm -hmm. you have to resolve it somehow, and that might be renaming one of them. So if you know that they're different, but you still want to use both of them, well then you just might rename one of them. And PureScript Run, mm -hmm. you can you can go through one of those and like rename just one of the cases if you needed to or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's what you're basically doing is writing an interpreter where you just reinterpret it into run, but I've renamed one of the labels. So it's kind of, it's, they're all, it's, it's that same pattern of just, uh, you don't have to, you don't have to interpret it into AF. You can still re, you can interpret it into run and get something else out of it, a different run data type out of it, but it's all kind of the same. So there's no wrapper, like there's no tag around the different things that you're. Well, I mean, they, they do. The, the tag is just tracked at the type level. And so it's, it uses row types. So PureScript variant, you, you'd, you'd want to read PureScript variants readme first. And mm -hmm. PureScript uh, variants readme kind of helps explain the problem of why, what an extensible data type is. So like what you have, or with row types. So 
you know, records are sort of a polymorphic or a structural product, which lets us have, uh, lets us be polymorphic over the structure of, uh, of a product type where you have these different, different values all at the same time at runtime, but you only care about subsets of them maybe. And variant is a polymorphic sum type where you only care about certain cases versus, uh, so it's kind of the dual of, uh, of a record where record is a polymorphic product, variant is a, is a polymorphic sum type. And what that just means is that when you inject something into variant, um, it just creates a, it creates a single tag wrapper where the tag, it's like a type value pair where the label that you're using for some data type is just a string at runtime. So, but you don't have to like create, and it's not nested in any way. It's just always just a single tag associated with some value. Yeah, I really appreciate the excellent uh, explanations in the variant library and the run library for these concepts. Um, one other one other question was about I had about uh, that real code data type is you parameterize it over the type A I think right so that uh, like a read file and it has two uh, you know, two tag types that like well, like the, the read file has a string and then a, a, a maybe string for represents the returned file contents right if it exists right. it's a maybe and then that uh, but it's a maybe string to an A right, right. so I, I've seen these uh, these uh, Encodings and like I, I just can't get in my head the intuition for what that uh, returning an A means. Is it is it pretty similar intuition to like a continuation? Um, yeah, that's exactly what it if is. That, if that's the case, then like the done case also has that continuation. <laughs> well, the done has just like a value to it. It doesn't have a so the continuation is that. Oh yeah, I see. You can't do you can't do the next part of your program until you supply something. So like if I'm using write file, I can't determine, or if I'm using read file, I can't determine what I do after that until I supply the content. So I have to put a function into the data type. And so that means when I'm writing the interpreter, I pull out the function and then when I have a value to get the, I can pass it to the function and get the next part of the computation. Uh -huh. That kind of makes that, that A represents the, like the, the, the monad, uh, like, like the monad. Um, yeah, it's like the, the sequencing. This, right? The A represents the monad value. Well, no, the A just represents uh, some value in it. The, the A is just because real code might, it might be real code int, or it might be real code string, or it might be real code Boolean. You know, the real code itself doesn't care about what return value you're returning. Oh, you, you, yeah. could, you could take away the A parameter and enforce that real code always yields a string, right? But you don't want to do that because I want to be able to do multiple things with it. So I'm just pulling that, at, that assumption out as a type parameter. So that A is the return value of this entire- Yeah, of the computation. More right. Of, right? Yeah, right. Okay, exactly. okay. So then uh, to connect that with the uh, more, like the- Actually, you know what? There's actually a typo in my uh -huh. example, which I didn't notice before. Uh -huh. And um, let me share the screen and I'll- So can y'all see this? Yeah. What it should actually be, this is something that's wrong in this example and I'll, I'll have to correct it, but this actually shouldn't be just a bare A in the read file, write file, and HTTP get cases. Mm -hmm. It represents the next part of the computation, but that should actually be like maybe string to real code A, right. unit, unit to real code A, it should, it's because mm -hmm. it should be a recursive data type and also string to real code A and then, but then done would just be done A. So that represents the end of the computation. Mm, okay. So that, that this is an error in, in this data type right now. And so this probably, you know, it helps to actually type check your, <laughs> your examples. <laughs> and this is a case where actually type checking my examples would, uh, would reveal that. Uh, I have one question about the squiggly A. So right. you're, still, you're still getting your A back. You're just making an, an, an implicit assumption. Yeah, it's just, so where this, and just something like this right here, this real code A to squiggly, or you know, real code to app with a squiggly arrow. All I'm doing in this case is just removing some kind of redundancy, right? So I have this pattern a lot where I have like a for all A of some type to some other type. And so the squiggly arrow is just a type alias. So it, uh, on one level, it just lets us encapsulate that pattern. And so we don't have to repeat the for all a everywhere. I mean, you can obviously include the for all a everywhere and you don't get anything out of it. But, uh, 
what's nice, like with the interpreter aspect is that sometimes you want to take an interpreter as an argument. And what this does mean, what this means is that you'll get like a rank and if you take a squiggly arrow as an argument, you'll get a rank N for, or like a rank two for all A. So what that means is that you want to take an interpreter and enforce that it is polymorphic over the contents of that, that, it, that it interprets. And now, so, is that in the prelude, the squiggly arrow? Yes, the squiggly arrow is in the prelude, yeah. Okay. That's, it's just called, it's type natural transformation. Yes. So the, uh, the reason that you use that um, natural transformation there, uh, it wasn't just because, because like I use that sometimes just because like, oh, it's kind of, it's kind of neat, right? Right, yeah. On, on one level, it's just removing yeah, redundancy. But, but it, does it help with the, um, uh, like, type inference there? or No, it's exactly the same as writing it explicitly. It's okay. just, it's, um, I think oftentimes it's, it's the intention, like you're, the way it looks like when you're reading it. Whenever I see squiggly arrow, I immediately think interpreter, like me personally. I don't know if everyone thinks this, but... I know, especially if you want to, if you're writing code that takes an interpreter as an argument, mm -hmm. then when I see that squiggly arrow, that means I've got like a rank two type. I got to pass in an actual polymorphic function. And what that does, what rank n types or, or rank n polymorphism does is it just it enforces the different levels of the contract of polymorphism. If, it, if I didn't have the rank n type, then, um, then the caller would still get to decide what that type was. But by specifying like a rank in parameter, then that means that I still, I might get to specify what it is. And I, and I just enforce that the implementation they're providing has to be polymorphic over anything. And so I could substitute my, then as like the, like a library writer, I could substitute my own type or something like that. And so it's kind of like this push and pull or like kind of like consumer producer who gets to, you know, the caller, callee, who gets to decide what. And so, so the ranking kind of like flips that around. And so who gets to decide what, which type parameter it is? Um, yeah, then I think you, uh, the, the, the last question I had was uh, you, you started to touch on it at the end, but uh, you talked about like this initial encoding of uh, like a real code mm -hmm. algorithm. Did, did you also start to touch on a final encoding? Well, final encoding like, um, would be what we did at the start. It would be the first part of the uh -huh. talk. So a final encoding is something that takes an implementation as an argument. So I, I'm going to write this in terms of an implementation that someone else provides. So versus mm. I'm going to write this implementation in terms of my own assumptions this, that's encapsulated in the real code data type. Okay, instead of that, I'm going to write it in terms of the implementation that someone else provides, and that would be a final encoding. Mm. But what that okay. means is, is that I, I, don't, I can't then... I can't use that implementation because I would be writing something polymorphic. Um, you know, the, I, I want it to be polymorphic over whatever their implementation does. So maybe over some M since they're getting to decide that I can't decide it, which means I can't observe it. So all I can do is call the functions that they provide, but then I can't observe anything after that fact. I would have to maybe take other implementations that let me extract it or something like that. So you could then you could keep piling it on, but um, that's kind of like where the crux is, is that, um, like within an initial encoding, you since if it's it's a transparent kind of representation, then you can always pull it apart and, and look at it, even after the fact. Versus a final encoding just would mean that uh, I can't do that. Like as a library writer, I wouldn't be able to then take that implementation and then observe it unless you know I make the assumption that they pass me a very like a monomorphic representation, like a specific representation that I know I can look at. So it's, it's um, like, that's kind of like, you might hear that call like, uh, like CPS or continuation passing style or something like that. And so type classes are kind of an automatic kind of CPS encoding. So like it's, you're just taking things as arguments and call and the compiler calls them for you. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the reason I ask about it is because um, there's like, I, I've heard one opinion that there is some difference between this uh, initial encoding and the fine. Well, this there, there is in, in that stack, stack space usage yeah. or data, data heap usage. Or these, these yeah. So they things. have different trade-offs. They might have different like runtime characteristics and like efficiency characteristics uh -huh. and stuff like that. Um, as far as like expressivity, mm -hmm. there's, there's very few differences. There's like the only, the only real difference is that you can't really, make an initial encoding of an actual continuation you know you can put a continuation in an initial encoding but you can't like make an initial encoding of a continuation like a continuation is kind of fundamental 
And so mm -hmm. you'll see like, oh, like, like comparing and contrasting MTL to like free or freer effects or something like that. And so someone will inevitably bring up, oh, you can't write like comp T, you know, in an initial encoding and something like that. And that's because you can put, you know, con continuations are kind of fundamental. You can't create an initial encoding of a continuation. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're roughly the same idea. So if, if you write in this uh, initial encoding and then later you find that maybe you, you need to use this other final encoding, mm -hmm. it should be relatively trivial to... And it, well, from one to the five. way I think of it is that um, like this initial encoding of like a program of this data type is it's like, it's like a syntax tree, you know, like this, it looks like an AS, you're defining a data type and you can build a tree out of it. And so as long as the semantics of the things that, thing that you're writing kind of works mm. in work works with kind of like the semantics of graphic graphing trees and branches and substituting branches, then you're okay. But if you have, you can get into cases where uh, like some type classes don't really have that semantic, so the semantic, like Kant T doesn't have that semantics. You, it's not really substituting trees, like specific trees. It's not AST substitution. And uh, so that, that, that's a little, that's kind of how I understand it. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there, there might be a better explanation for it, but, uh, mm -hmm. for, for a lot of applications, it is, it's, it's plenty expressive enough. And so that's where you get where the expressivity is not quite the same as that. And, and then you get the trade-off is that, so initial encodings, you can't, you have to express it in terms of like trees and stuff substitu tree substitution but you can inspect it at any point because you have a tree, you have a, like a real thing that you're holding on to that you can look at. Whereas with a final encoding, you get more expressivity in the sense that you can take any implementation, the representation doesn't matter, but the trade-off is, is that you can't inspect it. So that's kind of like the dual, like trade-off versus expressivity. Mm -hmm. So. All right. I have, a, I have a question. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, a lot of software evolves over time, and abstraction offers reuse, but it also necessitates some amount of uniformity. So have you ever struggled to adapt software to new requirements, which disturbs the uniformity of an abstraction that you use? Yeah, I think, um, I think you always run into those cases in like real world, real world applications in that you might have, you might make, you might make a trade off where I don't want something to be as, cause like you can always, if you say everything's always apt, then that means that you can always do everything. It doesn't matter where you are. It's kind of like programming in JavaScript. <laughs> if you say, you know, if, if you allow uh, side, side effects everywhere, if you say everything is an app, then that means you have no restrictions, but that also means that you can't really reason about your program abstractly. You can just say, you can say like, okay, I, I'm making the assumption maybe based on the name or maybe just based on the type of the arguments of what this does, but I'm not actually restricting the implementation in any way. And at any point, the, implementa the actual implementation could do something, could diverge from that wildly. And so it's always like an interesting uh, trade-off where I may want to restrict the implementation and that would be like in terms of either my data type or it might be in terms of which classes I write it in terms of, you know, something that's fully polymorphic, doesn't assume half or something like that. It's only, spec it's only implemented in terms of uh, like the interfaces maybe you request. And sure, I mean, you, you, it's easy to get, it, you can get into that case where, oh man, I just really wish I could have like do whatever. I just really want like a piece of mutable like AF state. I just want a ref and I can do that. Maybe you, re maybe you request monad AF or something. And, but monad AF is kind of like, I feel like monad AF is kind of giving up where, you know, where you're saying like, I want to be able to like monad AF to me is like, okay, I really have all these other constraints, but I'm going to request monad AF because really I want to be able to do whatever I want. And um, so that's kind of what to me like monad AF or monad F kind of, kind of means. But, uh, you know, so, so what I'm doing like right now at Awake is I'm trying as best as I can to, <laughs> like I'm using, we're using run and I'm doing as best as I can to never introduce like sort of an AF effect or an F effect or something. You know, all of our business logic is defined in terms of these data types. And uh, it's, it's uh, for our, like I've been able to find like a good balance 
Um, I did have to introduce some sort of like AVAR write sort of thing because I wanted to be able to observe something that I couldn't observe otherwise. Um, but it's still, it's only restricted to like a write, like within the actual logic. Someone else can provide the value, but, and the logic can only write to it, but like it can't produce like arbitrary mutable state or something like that, you know, in app. And so it's, it's kind of like distilling down exactly what you need. And um, so sometimes you do, you have to adapt to it. Like, like you, there, you, you are going to have to go back and refactor it. And sometimes that can be tedious. It's like, it's hard to say like, I'm going to be, I'm going to have to know, I'm going to know all of my requirements over time. That's like, that's impossible to know. And so you're going to have to refactor it. You're going to have to change your assumptions. And um, with at least with something extensible, you can always just pile on different requirements, you know, right? You know, all your require, all your previous requirements still hold. Uh, you're not, you're not changing those existing requirements. You're just adding to it. You might add to it. And that's, that's one way where, uh, so that's kind of like the expression problem. So the expression problem is, you know, being able to like change exist, or, you know, add new require or add new requirements without changing existing code and uh, or recompiling existing code. And that's kind of the same thing. Um, at least like with polymorphic things, like either with like type classes and stuff like that, you can always add more requirements, but you don't have to like change your existing requirements that kind of makes sense. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I mean, like, I think it's inevitable that you're going to have to refactor something and add new requirements. And I think with like something like type classes and something like extensible, extensible uh, sums and interpreters that it's less bad. <laughs> like it's less, te it's less tedious, you know, it does help you. It's not, it's not just a trade off of, you know, this is, this makes me look super smart. It does let you, keep existing code without having to change it and I still add new requirements to it. All right, well, that's great. Thanks for the answer and thanks for the presentation. Enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've thought of another question I have for you is that uh, usually if uh, the difference between this initial encoding and uh, this final encoding using type classes, um, like a lot of type classes I see, like they have like little laws ascribed next to it that says right. like how you, use the two methods of this um, type class together and what should happen. Um, have you, have you, uh, I think you're doing some kind of initial encodings uh, with, you have experience mm -hmm. doing it. So have you, have you like ascribed laws to your different? I had this discussion with like, with a little bit with Phil to at the, the presentation and the way I kind of look at it is when you're taking an implementation as an argument, you want, you want to put a contract on that implementation. Like someone is supplying what you actually do with it. And so if I'm going to call that, then I want to be able to reason about it as an author. I want to be able to say like, if I call this function with this function that uh, I can predict what's going to happen out of it. But the dual of that with an initial encoding is that I'm just using a data type. My assum the, the, ex the assumptions all exist algebraically in my data type. I'm just constructing that data type. And what someone does with that isn't really necessarily my problem. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, like I've, I've constructed something concretely. Like the, 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 the construction is valid because I've constructed it. And um, an interpreter can then take that. An interpreter can always do crazy things out of it, but because it's transparent, they can do it as a transparent representation. They can do whatever they want with it. And right, it's, it's still he has a contract of what, how the interpreter should interpret it. It's the same thing as like, if, I, don't, I don't really think, I mean, I mean, I mean if you do, right as, as an interpreter, you're consuming, when you're writing an interpreter, you're consuming the data type. And so I guess maybe if you have, I, I think maybe you can think about it as like invariance, maybe invariance on like a data structure. So like if you're, if you were looking at something like a map data type, you know, maybe there's invariance encoded in the data type that aren't necessarily represented in the actual data type, like uh, that it has to be balanced or it has to be something, you know, there's some, there's some invariant that you have to maintain if you're going to like prod, prod at it and do something like that. And that, in that sense, maybe the dual of laws is invariant is data type invariance. And, you know, and so like, if you want, if you want to maintain a, a coherent construction, then you have to maintain the invariance of the construction. And, you don't always, you can't always represent all the invariants in the actual data type. But the point is, is that you, 
but you do want as much as you can create a construction that you can't violate, right? So one one way maybe with maps is that you're uh, you know you're using like smart constructors or something, so you can't just like arbitrarily prod at the data type. It's maybe it's still transparent. It's not less transparent, but it's still interpretable. But you can only interpret it in ter in terms that keep the invariance. So. I, I think maybe that's kind of the dual of laws with so laws with a with a final encoding you want laws you want to be able to say like if I'm going to take an implementation I want to be able to reason about it if I'm going to call it versus with a data type maybe you have invariance where if I'm going to like look at this data type uh, you know I have to make sure that the construction makes sense uh, does that help yeah yeah it gives me it gives me something to think about further yeah yeah. So uh, like laws are generally just kind of like, they're, they're not usually that, that big of a deal, frankly. I mean, most of the time they're just like, they just assume that like if you, do, if you do call this in a certain way, you get something coherent out of it. And I think it's the same idea. Right, I, I've, I've heard, I've heard uh, a few people talk about like, oh, but laws would be nice to also use for you know, business logic, right? And here you're, you're talking about using, uh, encoding business logic in this initial encoding for sequencing yeah. it and such. And yeah, so if, if you want to talk about using business logic stuff and you can use laws to describe, yeah, but. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like if like, there's also like, if you're, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna like pull out these like monad requests, monad, whatever, HTTP, stuff like that, uh, you know, maybe try adding laws to them. But <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're writing like a business application, it's not necessarily like you control that domain. I mean, like the laws aren't necessarily that big of a deal because you, you're fully in control of it. As a library author, yeah, you want someone, if someone's gonna try to re use it, reuse this, then you want people who are gonna use it to be able to reason about it. And it's, it's, it's ideal that you can do that for your business logic, but it's, it's also, you're also completely in control of it anyway. And so it's not necessarily a requirement that you have like a really like set defined, of, set definition of a coherent laws for these things. Because the important the point is to enable code reuse and not necessarily well, like you, idea, ideally you can, you can you want it's possible that you want to have one initial encoding of your you know business workflow steps right and then you want to have two different interpreters one that interprets it in this in like the in the, your your server one that interprets that same thing construction in the browser and you want to like you have to interpret them slightly differently because like right. the, the the needs of that interpreter in a browser UI workflow would be slightly different like I don't know. So then, like, I'm, I'm just saying, like, if you're gonna have multiple interpreters and in different systems, maybe maybe you'll have two different browser interpreters too. One for like a headless and like a head, and one with a UI. And you might want to have some consistency enforced between these different interpreters. And one way to do that would be to just ascribe in the one place. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Some, so, 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 something I think about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I got to run. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you guys for listening. Yeah. Hope it was, Super hope it was good, good topic. Thanks a lot for sharing. Thanks again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right. All right. See you guys. Yeah, we'll see you in it. Um, yeah. So I, like, I, I don't know if anybody else wants to do a little bit of chatting before we uh, close up. But, uh, uh, how's everybody feeling about uh, 0 0.12? <laughs> oh, I, I really not, like it. I haven't touched it yet. Oh, I'm, um, gosh, just getting rid of the uh, the effects, right? <laughs> oh, that's, oh, yeah, just that's last week I was refactoring some effects just last week, and it was super frustrating. And I'm like, I'm just going to leave this for now and come back to it whenever I migrate to 0 0.12. <laughs> Well, I, I switched to Pure Script IO in in my point eleven program already, and and man, that was fun. And so point twelve <laughs> is going to be even more fun. Yeah. No, in, in fact, um, uh, we got our uh, web audio uh, library out for Pure Script, and um, we had it ready actually uh, weeks ago, and you know we're not anticipating this compiler release. So um, <laughs> after getting it ready and you know, we are about to push the <laughs> push it out, you know, here comes 12. <laughs> and, uh, so I went through, of course, there's a lot of um, modules 
that had to be refactored with uh, with the new effects. But yeah, it's a real positive change. I, I think that's one of the really nice things in 12. And yeah. some of the stuff that Nate was talking about today is in a way a bit of a substitute for how we used to track effects. Like you, if you, if you want to kind of write more constrained programs that that can only do certain things and kind of keep track of what they're doing. He's he's talking about some of the ways you can do that now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember initially getting into pure script and really trying to understand what it means to have these effect rows on on the on the F type and. Like I couldn't understand why some of these effects would be ejected, like the state, the state effects, right? They mutate some effects and kind of track that in that row type, and like so that's that that one would be ejected, but others right. wouldn't, like uh, like the DOM effect, and and it just really felt like we're trying to encode some interpreter here, and we're just kind of doing it wrong. Yeah. But um, I think that's not that wasn't the the original purpose, or the original intent. It's not interpreter. It's just like this theoretical, um, gee, if there was such a wide type for an I.O., wouldn't it be kind of nice to know what's happening? Yeah, and, and you do lose that. That's one thing I, I noticed immediately as I was taking these effects rows out and going, okay, so what are those effects now <laughs> that I was using? I had to start looking at, at the code mm -hmm. itself to go, oh, yeah, that was a, a read or, or, oh, yeah, I was using you know, some other effect there, right? So you do lose that, and so in fact, maybe that's something that should be added to the documentation. It's like these are the following effects that uh, you know this particular module is is leveraging, because you're not going to see it immediately anymore in the type signature. I never had a compelling example, really. Uh, you know, I like I like the effects that, like Alex was saying, that you can discharge, like if you catch a exception then you lose the exception effect that to me is useful but for example you know as soon as you use a avar somewhere well then you know right up to main now you've got this avar effect and i never really ran into you know <laughs> i have you know like a thirty thousand line program or something like that and so i just have this like giant stack of effects that were sitting on my main and i don't really know what the value of that is right it's like so I, so personally, I like that they're reduced, but. I, I ended up having a type alias for a type synonym for all oh, yeah. the effects possible in my program. Yeah. And then rather than annotating specific functions as only using a single effect, I just put that type synonym everywhere. So like if, you, if you're reading that and trying to get some semantic value out of these function signatures, it's like every function is using the DOM, is using the DOM effect now, even though it probably isn't. Yeah, yeah, no. <clears throat> yeah, because it's because all the effects are contagious. So you know you can have a piece of code that calls something else, and you wouldn't know that it's the other thing that's being called. But does the effect first? So there's that sort of contagious effect. And then yeah, like you said, like I ended up just having an alias on you know virtually every file that was just called Fs, and it was just a giant list of all the effects I used. And then I only used the alias. So if you're if you're actually reading the source code. And, You'd have to know what that alias expanded to to even know the effects. So, yeah. Um, but what I <clears throat> know Nate's also working on is check exceptions, and I'm working on that as well. And um, I think that will be a much better use of uh, this sort of. It's not an effect row; it's a uh, exception row. But um, you know, it'll be kind of like the exception effect, other except you can have more types of exceptions. So I think that'll be useful. It's something that I actually do like in, in Java. I know developers go either way on it, but <laughs> 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 I happen I happen to uh, favor it. So well, it's, a, well, it's I, nice to have it as an option. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I couldn't find a way of keeping them. Is it is it really uh, as a version 12 uh, the effect rows go away completely because I couldn't either that or some of the modules just haven't been updated yet uh, to be able to support them. But it seemed like it was, you know, one or the other. You had to get yeah, they go. They go away completely. And, and like, if you want to, if you want to track effects in 12, 
or do something like tracking effects, then I think what you have to do is the kind of thing that Nate was talking about today. Like you have to go, move to a kind of interpreter pattern where mm -hmm. you uh, where you're describing the things that can be done, and then and then it's 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 those types that are then. Um, kind of telling you, giving you the, the ways to reason about what this part of the program is doing and what that part of the program is doing because of the very interpreters and how you combine them. Uh, I, I think that the F with the Effectro, it's still available as a library. Um, I'm not sure where it's located now, uh, like PureScript and Trib or PureScript dep Deprecated, I'm not sure. but. There was, I believe there was nothing in the compiler itself which explicitly enforced or you know, pre prevented use of other things. Like I, like, I think it was only a library convention thing. Well, so I certainly if you can't get them to compile. Library. If you leave them in, it doesn't compile. Well, I mean, well, you, can, you can do an unsafe course, like at the very top level into just the oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. role list effect. Yeah, that's and true. And then if you want to keep using it yourself and you can do some unsafe coerces from standard right. libraries to right. um, in effect with that row and annotate it with the specific type used. It would be some more work for yourself. I mean, maybe you'd want to start up some separate ecosystem or some set, set, set of libraries which wraps the row list um, function mm -hmm. if you're interested in doing that. Yeah, I was also happy to see that uh, pulp has been up, updated now so that people don't run into the problem with Bower. Mm -hmm. And they had a, a number of newbies complaining that they couldn't get uh, <laughs> yeah. things going. And it seems like that happens every uh, compiler release. And if there's something, some way we could try and mitigate that going mm -hmm. forward, even if it means holding back the release until some of the core, you know, libraries are, are updated. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was pretty, pretty rough. I only started using PureScript at uh, point 0.11, but I've been using for a few months and so by the time point 12 released, I knew enough to overcome the hurdles. But my goodness, just everything broke. Like if you were new coming to the language, you know, you download the platform and the hello world doesn't run. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, like, that's how you fix this. And, you know, yeah, so that's definitely um, something to look out for because you know, for growing the community, that's, that's going to be pretty rough on people. And I, I think part of the solution for that is an annotating wherever, wherever code, uh, whatever code is. If, if you want to run some code, you an annotate like which version of the compiler you, the, the reader should use for yeah. it. Um, because like the PeerScript book is still going to be using 0.11 for a while. Because um, yeah. I think Phil, you know, he can't update an entire book in a weekend. Um, so there, there's, with every break and release, you, you're going to have to be able to support two versions or three versions of the compiler. Yeah. Just make that but easier for people. Bauer, I think Bauer just inherently makes it harder on people because I mean, I'm, I'm not proficient with JavaScript yeah. tooling, but if you just tell Bauer to install something, I think it just grabs the latest version all the time, unless you tell it explicitly what version um, to grab. I think up, up to major versions. Yeah. Yeah. So, you but know, it, it, won't, it won't verify that whatever libraries you're picking work with whatever compiler oh, exactly. you use. You have yeah. to know which version, which library version is compiler compatible with the compiler for each one. Yeah. And that's so what the SE package is. There's, there's, there's a period where point 12 came out and I'm in the middle of a project, so I couldn't just immediately switch to it. So I'm still on point 11. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm using Bower. So, mm -hmm. you know, I had the, uh, difficulty of every time I told Bauer to install something, it would automatically go to basically the point 12 compatible version. And to figure out what the point 11 compatible version is, I essentially have to, I have to like go on pursuit and I got to like click through the GitHub link and I got to look at their Bauer file and tags. Yeah, like yeah. I got to do it all myself. And <laughs> so yeah, I hope this, um, uh, what's, what's the name of it? PSC package. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope, I hope uh, you know, that, that tool gets developed more and because mm -hmm. um, I think that'll resolve a lot of the problems. So even if you're, if you, even if you're a newbie, it could just say use point 11 and then you say, uh, you just point your package manager at the point 11 package set and away you go. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. Yeah, there's still some rough, 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 rough edges. Um, but yeah, otherwise PSC is super nice to have around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd still like to explore, like, like have some other packaging systems explored where it does do some level of version solving and then while allowing you to pin, a specific, uh, pin them to a specific compiler. But uh, <laughs> I don't have the time to work on that, so <laughs> I'm just happy to have GFC package around. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, try, I tried to use it. I just couldn't quite use it yet just because um, I tend to have three or four pack packages I'm working on simultaneously. Um, and any particular thing I'm working any particular thing I'm working on. And so I want to be able to make a little change in this module. And then uh, the way I do it with Bower, right? Bower just lets you point to directories and then you can just install packages from directories. And so that makes it very easy. So I just edit the package and then I just do Bower install where I want to use that package and then it's very convenient for development. But with PSC package right now, what I'd have to do is I'd have to have I'd have to have uh, my own package set, which would have to be on GitHub. And then, you know, if I want to make a change to a package and get it over here, I'd have to make the change in this package. And then I'd have to like tweak a thing in the package set. I'd have to like upload it all to GitHub. It's 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 yeah, so much more work. <laughs> just I think the only difficult part about PSC package in my eyes is the package set management. Like you have to make a copy of it and then host that yourself somewhere. But yeah. I think I think somebody maybe Christoph or Hardy maybe was working on a doll. Um, uh, replacement for that package set you know, definition, which would make it. So I think because I think Doll has a thing where you can just point to an ex, like any old URL or any like file system path for extensions to an existing set of um, for for this case packages, and uh, it should make it a lot easier to work with. And once somebody has spearheaded this um, and uh, and been able to explain to other people how to use Doll to. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't describe, even heard of that. So describe such a thing you said. Yeah, it's kind of like a language. Um, like DAW itself is kind of like a language. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I have. Yeah. I, I yeah. wish. I wish somebody would kind of talk about it. Uh, <laughs> well, there you go. Next talk. Next. Next. Get oh, together. Oh, I'm far too busy. Uh, my interests lie elsewhere. This is just a <laughs> auxiliary <laughs> interest. I wish I could learn, but. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, yeah, 12. So I just saw this at the last minute. How often do you guys uh, normally get together for these? Um, this one, like this, because there's two different meetups, uh, virtual meetups that we do. Uh, mm -hmm. There's this one, Unscripted, and this one's once a month. I think it's the second Saturday, first or second Saturday. Um, and then there's the, there's like a hack, like a hack meetup. And that's on the, like the third or fourth Saturday. So they're two weeks apart, each of these. Um, yeah, like, I, like I, I'm not I'm not too great at organizing the hack one, but I kind of do that. Um, and there's a few people that show few people that show up for that one. Um, and then for this unscripted one, um, I usually try and get like one person to organize some some sort of talk, topic to to discuss. Um, yeah. Cool. And uh, that's all updated on. I see you got a Google Calendar for unscripted. Uh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. some, so, so, sometimes the, <laughs> we have some issues with scheduling because uh, like Google, Google Calendar is pretty good at organizing like time zone differences. Um, but then we kind of use this gathering.peerscript.org for um, doing RSVP and event updates. And like the, like the time zones kind of get out of sync. So sometimes they'll be an hour off or an hour late. Um, around, especially around times of daylight saving switches, like falling back or falling forward. Um, but yeah, generally that's the schedule. Okay. Time's complicated. All programmers yeah. know oh. this. <laughs> I know, right? Of all people, like I should be kind of pretty good at this stuff, like as a programmer, but oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you ever have a something interest, interesting you worked on, um, and you're able to say a few words about it, um, it doesn't always have to. You don't, you don't have to have like slides. I mean, sometimes like it's helpful to have slides, but uh, just even walking through code and explaining concepts is um, pretty awesome. Uh, help helpful for lots of other people. Mm -hmm. No, I really like really like Nate's uh, topic, and I noticed that I've 
sort of done the uh, sort of thing it's talking about actually in, in the code I've done. So it was really interesting to hear his take on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his next talk, when he gets into variant F, I think that'll be pretty interesting because I've been sort of eyeballing this variant F and um, I haven't used it for anything yet. So hopefully mm -hmm. you can educate me on uh, the good use case. So that variant F seems to be like the free, mo the extensible free monad for, yeah. your, for writing these DSLs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I look forward, look forward to seeing that for sure. Var like variant is probably my favorite thing in any programming language right now. <laughs> extensible subtypes is. Uh, yeah, it's super interesting. Nice. I, th I think I think the like the interesting difference between the variant and pure script and the variant and like, I think variant that the idea kind of originates in OCaml, <laughs> um, where I haven't used OCaml, so maybe it has it, but yeah, I, like uh, me, yeah, me too. But I, I, I from what I've read, like it, the OCaml compiler, it does type inference, and it'll it, like it'll infer, um, like if you say something is a string and an int, like it'll infer that um, it's a variant string or int, <laughs> mm -hmm. depending on. Which is pretty interesting because here's the compiler. It won't infer that a thing is a variant. It's monomorphic or polymorphic or polymorphic constraints, but never this like extensible. Yeah. No, for a few a few years, like using Haskell, I was always thinking what I could do if I could just write a case uh, a case analysis where I could you know cover like five cases and then there'd be others left open. And then I could just use that piece of code wherever I want to handle those five cases. And then, you know, this is exactly what variant lets mm -hmm. me do. And, um, it's especially useful for error handling is where I like it right now. Um, so it's nice stuff because anytime I try to do error handling before it, it's always because you know you have this error or that error. It's a big, it's a big subtype, and then you gotta like you get a certain, you know, you get like a file system error, which might be like file not found or um, a permission problem or something like this. And so you have that some type, and then you have this other system which uses the network. So then you have your some type of network things. And then you have this one block of code which has both file system and network. So now you need to combine these two sums and mm -hmm. without variant, mm -hmm. you gotta like wrap them both and make another. It's just, it uh, turns into. Yeah, error management is such <laughs> a critical part of uh, writing a real code, right? <laughs> Like error management, it's you, you have to deal with it. You, you have to like bail out of an, bail out of some workflow early if there's some invariant is not you know there, yeah. and then you have to bail out early, and then and then you have to handle different different categories of errors differently. Mm -hmm. um, like maybe sometimes you can just kind of recover from it easily. And all that time. But yeah, yes. um, it's 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 so easy to just say oh just 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 use the either type right or the results and just put the errors oh, yeah. inside. Yeah, but what's your error type? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's and that that's kind of like what all the books do is like oh if you have errors you can just use the left right. Yeah. The left. Yeah, the left tag. But yeah, there's more to it. I think, like you say. Mm -hmm. So that's all this. Yeah. Anyone else got uh, some interesting libraries they're working on or anything like that? Um, I, I'm about out of time here. We usually schedule about two hours, and I think we've, we've hit two hours. <laughs> cool. Yeah, Nate, uh, uh, I think we, we got Nate to talk a little bit more than he expected to talk. He said, oh, it's probably about 30 or 40 minutes. It's like, oh, this is actually way more interesting than just be 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, he came well prepared, so. Yeah. All right. Okay. We'll see you guys later. Yeah. yeah. Take care. Yeah. Thanks a lot for joining, guys. It's always super fun having having people to join. Us. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See you on the next one. Yeah. yeah. Enjoy your weekend. Yep. Cheers.